Uh, the overall argument of this paper is that the revival of Jainism in the modern period was a byproduct of British rule and uh, um, maybe deliberately nourished by British administration to keep the Jains loyal in the name of freedom of worship rather than political freedom. Under changed political and economic, economical conditions imposed by the colonial regime, on the one hand, new forms of national and communal self-consciousness were created by English educated Jain monks and laity modeled on the British paradigms. Most significantly, the notion of the Jains as a quasi-ethnic communal group itself. On the other hand, traditional sectarian identities were reasserted predominantly by traditional Jain monks and pundits and Jain members of the rural business classes who used the vernacular print media rather than English to spread their ideas. The word Jain, according to senior interviewees, I mean, I interviewed them maybe 10 years ago, um, was increasingly used as a family name instead of the Gotra name, clan name, <clears throat> mainly by educated Jains. It played a role in three contexts in particular. One, in the scramble for governmental jobs and other competitive material advantages. Two, in marriage negotiations beyond caste and sect barriers. And three, in the census, which for the first time conveyed official recognition on Jainism as a separate religion and Jains as an identifiable social segment. The label Jain made it easier to integrate individual members of traditional meat-eating low caste into the monastic orders, if not really into Jain society, which, despite the universalism of Jaina doctrine, is still virulently opposed to members of social, um, to intercourse, social intercourse with ex-meeting um, Indian groups uh, that converted uh, to one or other Jain sect individually, one has to say. Um, the different self-representations were wittingly or unwittingly echoed in the academic literature. I mean, this is one um, related argument. I, I think that the depiction of Jainism in the academic literature up to now really is uh, largely shaped uh, by uh, selective in, uh, interactions with representatives of the Jain community uh, from the 19th century onward. So in other words, the agents are the, the Jains, not the collectors and scholars here. A most interesting question concerns the influence of Orientalist scholarship on changing Jain self-definitions during the 19th and 20th centuries and the influence of contemporary Jains on the representation of Jain culture in academic scholarship and in the modern mass media in general. So-called Western scholars <clears throat> that is, foreign academics with an interest in Jainism, if nothing more, were and still are held in high regard by the Jains in India and beyond, and publicly honored with garlands and showered with praise, usually to their great embarrassment. Um, actually, I want to show this picture here. <laughs> okay. Uh, taken in Berlin. What is the rationale of the practice of honoring strangers who express an interest in one's religion? Surely it's not only a supposedly good karmic disposition that is publicly recognized, nor is the time-honored meritorious practice of Atiti Dana, offering hospitality to strangers, merely observed. After all, honor is a form of value and possessing value in the eyes of others is a form of power, as Thomas Hobbes uh, stated. Uh, quote, the manifestation of the value we set on one another is that which is commonly called honoring and dishonoring, end of quote. Are Jains simply submitting themselves and empowering anyone who comes along pretending to entertain an interest in Jainism? Of course not. Honor is a relational uh, uh, category. Honoring um, in practice works both ways. The one who honors is as much empowered as the one who is honored, if not more. In social life, it's always better to be the giver than the receiver. 
The law of reciprocity, so to speak, demands that the receiver of a gift is put under obligation to return. Honoring strangers may be better understood as a form of encompassment, of incorporating and placing an outsider in one's own value system. It is also a form of neutralization of a potential threat. Etiquette demands that the outsider is placed near the apex of the social hierarchy, in the Jaina case, just below the monks and community leaders. The interested visitor is seated on the dais or the front row of an assembly, is garlanded, praised and showered with gifts. Even if she uh, is a meat eater and lover of wines and spirits, the ceremonial is nothing but theatrical and not least entertaining for the audience. No one takes it all too serious. Though, um, though it, uh, I cannot read my notes here, as an initiation ritual, um, uh, it is not exactly an initiation ritual because it does not convey definite rights and duties on the foreign visitor. However, the refusal to participate in honoring ceremonies, apparently one of the most pleasurable pastimes of Jains, is considered a severe insult not only to the honoring party but to Jainism itself. A typical example of the um, stereotypical perceptions generated by polite but superficial colonial contacts established and maintained in this way, a report in the 19th century, for instance, is the following statement in the once widely read book, People of India, published by Forbes, Watson and JWK in 1868, some 10 years after the so-called mutiny of 1857. And uh, it's a long quote which I'm skipping about uh, the class of natives to which the Jains belong, uh, a lot of money and so on. Uh, their religion is Jain, he writes, and as they worship the god Parusnat, Parshwanat, all Hindus are intolerant towards them. And uh, being, it is being pronounced by Orthodox Hindus, contrary to their tenets to pass by the idol, idol Parusnat, or to see its temples built near their own. And so on. So the Jains are separate uh, out and set against uh, the Hindus in, in this way. As we will see, this stereotypical image of Jains as wealthy and peaceful people opposed to to, if not persecuted by Hindus, Muslims and the like, um, is uh, intentionally promoted by members of the Jain communities as well, uh, but it tells only half of the tale. Encounters with foreigners are also meticulously recorded by members of the Jain community, especially by the mendicants. However, few of their diaries are accessible in published or unpublished form. The diaries of Acharya Tulsi are one example uh, a rare handwritten monastic record of an encounter in the 19th century of a leading Stanakwasi monk with Jesuits has been translated by Peter Friedlander. There's a second uh, record uh, which, which I'm trying to uh, translate at some stage, but very few. From the foreigners, the Videshi's point of view, early contacts with Jains are documented in the records of travelers, missionaries, soldiers and colonial administrators such as ethnographers, librarians, census officer, uh, taxmen, orientalists, uh, etc. Um, Indological scholarship of Jainism was often but not always done from the remote, via letters and middlemen, often other Indologists in the service of the colonial government in India, but also booksellers. The social history of the intellectual encounters between Jain monks and foreign academics can, however, not be sufficiently understood on the basis of Indological publications alone. A yet unexplored source offering intimate insights in the relationship between Orientalists and the Jains is the correspondence between foreign scholars with Jain monks. Such letters can be compared with field reports of ethnographers because they document work in progress, the slow and hazardous ascent towards reasonably accurate understanding of time-honored features of the Jaina ways of life. 
and, uh, and so on. Most of the letters have not survived. Most significantly, the vast correspondence of Hermann Jacobi, which was destroyed during the bomb raid, bombing raid on his family house in Bonn. Uh, Jacobi translated the Jain scriptures <clears throat> into English or a significant set and made them in this form for the first time accessible both to uh, foreigners and to the Jains themselves because these texts were controlled by monastics and uh, certain supporters and uh, the knowledge was only accessible through these religious virtuosi. Uh, so Jacobi's correspondence was vast and very important. Um, because he was a pioneer, pioneer of the academic study of Jainism, whose English translations selected Shvetambara scriptures exerted a massive influence on the English educated Jain lay, lay intellectuals, giving them unprecedented direct access to the scriptures whose contents were strictly guarded by uh, the clerics. Some of Jacobi's letters are published in the volume entitled Letters uh, to Vijayantra Suri. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of things here. In the introduction to this very interesting volume, recently discussed by Jay Sony in uh, the article mentioned at the bottom here. Um, it is written in the introduction, unfortunately, Acharya Sri <coughs> excuse me, has not kept copies of the replies he sent to various scholars. If they would have been available, the whole work would have been an encyclopedic work on uh, Jain history, literature, and related um, uh, topics. There are other interesting um, works uh, documenting uh, correspondence, not least um, the first uh, uh, volume there, um, half in Gujarati, half in, in English, uh, about a um, exchange of letters between Dharma Vijaya and Jacobi. Um, the second entry here, Kapadia, is also interesting, uh, a uh, exchange of letters between Jacobi and a, a Jain lay person who acted as an intermediary. By rule, Jain monks were not allowed uh, traditionally to directly engage with uh, non-Jains or let, uh, definitely not with foreigners. So often um, mediators were used, actually were not allowed to communicate with each other. You know, they were wandering in different parts of India and if one monk wanted to communicate with another, and their monastic rules often, the letters had to be carried, or always had to be carried by some supporter. So uh, acting through mediators was traditional practice. Um, so it's very, un, uh, very modern and uncommon that to have direct communications as between Jacobi and uh, Dharma Vijaya, Indra Vijaya, and a, a, a select set of monks. Uh, I leave it to you to study these letters because they're readily available in these uh, publications and highly interesting. Um, most of the surviving letters of Jacobi and other scholars and monks are mostly interested in the communications between monks and uh, Western scholars um, because the, the Jain collections are the outcome of these interactions in the main. Most of the letters focus on philological questions and problems of access to manuscripts. Uh, they're not of interest for the social historian for modern uh, Jainism and broader questions, which, which I'm personally interested in. Um, this is at least my impression after studying a lot of these letters. Oops. Oops. So there's 6,000 manuscripts, as you can see, in Europe. And so I, I studied at, at least those. And uh, um, the following points can be substantiated. One, the dependency of European scholars on information spoon fed by them uh, by only a handful of modern Murti Puja Gashvetamra monks with a missionary zeal who were themselves opposed by the majority of Orthodox Jain monks and laity. 
This seems to explain the, explain the one-sided representation of Jainism in Western academic publications, noted by Schubring in the German original of the doctrine of the Jainas, which was inevitably biased towards the particular sectarian stance reflected in the sources made available to them. Uh, Jaini also has written on this. Uh, yet this is only one aspect. Many Digambara texts were published in the early 20th century by reformist Digambara laity and could have been translated and studied. However, European philologists were primarily interested in the Jain Prakrit languages and the oldest surviving Jaina sources, which are all Shvetambara. For similar reasons, the anachronic Jaina traditions were not studied at all because they have produced no significant commentary literature on the Agamas, Jain scriptures. The frank second, the frank exchange of opinions of the free thinking monks such as Vijayadharma Suri, Indra Vijay Suri and Hertel of Leipzig, for instance, demonstrate already uh, the financial dependency of European scholars and collections, I suppose, on Jain support, especially after World War I, which devastated Europe. Um, the traffic was not all one way, uh, uh, scholars as Said would wish us to believe, you know, between uh, the Orient and the, the Occident. On the contrary, the Jains set the agenda by feeding and holding back information and occasionally by selectively funding academic projects in the West. If one studies the letters of Hertel in, in Leipzig, for instance, an enormous collection, um, which uh, uh, Annette uh, partly uh, made available to me, or fully made available to me, but I only read part of them um, in the last uh, week or so. Um, there one can see he, he, he requested money to be sent for this and that project. And actually, Jaina studies in the West is partly uh, Jain funded research and the collections would it not have been possible without the financial input of the communities in India as well. That is only one aspect but an important one often forgotten. Third, the mendicants who collaborated with Western academics were and still are modern monks with an interest in global mission. They faced severe criticism from the majority of conservative sectarian mendicants who obtained objected to the publication of the scriptures and to social reforms, such as the abolishment of sectarian and caste identities, um, fixed uh, gender roles, relaxation of prohibition of overseas travel, etc. Both parties of the correspondence, the Indologists and the modern Jain monks, were fringe figures in a fragile social and economic position who seemed to have struck a strategic partnership if not always friendship, fueled by a common interest in literature and mutual interest in furthering their professional and religious interests and careers. And uh, because time is short, I will just show you a little bit of the evidence. Uh, I'm mainly focused on the uh, manuscripts in Berlin, which I've studied um, in the context of uh, um, writing on the, um, the work on Johannes Klatt. So uh, this is kind of a summary. In the letters, you can see different ways in which manuscripts were dealt with between uh, scholars and monks, etc. They were borrowed and returned or not returned, uh, copied, photographed, or bought. Not everything was bought and entered in collections here. A lot was actually via even interlibrary exchange, which, which worked well within the British Empire um, up to a certain point. And, uh, um, okay. and there are different types of collection practices. Uh, okay. this, uh, you know all of these things. There are different types of mediators. Uh, thieves, uh, of course, should not be forgotten. <laughs> and, uh, um, okay, so Hernle and Vijay and Andasuri, they had an interesting exchange of uh, letters through mediators, Vijay and Andasuri was not writing uh, himself. And this is here, uh, uh, Indra Vijaya, who I mentioned. This is the uh, correspondence that has been published in the volume I mentioned before. And 
um, here this is Dharma Vijaya and Jacobi, who had a, a long exchange of letters, a very formal exchange of letters. Letter, letters by Hertel they have a more a personal um, feel to it, but Jacobi was always, you know, very, very formal. So the tone of the letters are different. And they discussed very interestingly uh, why Westerners, uh, Germans eat meat and the Jains not, and what is a superior way. And uh, Jacobi made a desperately failed attempt to convince uh, Dharma Vijaya that meat eating is actually due to climatic conditions, a necessity, and uh, that doesn't work. And so they have a discussion actually on the, uh, about mutual beliefs. It is not just, you know, a one-sided, you know, imposition of, of Western views, etc., exploitation. But I think uh, Dharma Vijaya comes out better in this uh, rational discourse. And you can just see that uh, a few points here. Okay, well, this is all about this. Um, I think he's actually right. The killing of animals for food purposes has actually resulted in the practice of extreme brutality by the civilized Europeans for trifling and unpardonable purposes. Uh, Jacobi didn't, wasn't able to reply to this. But they settled on friendship as the mode of, and common literary interest as a mode of communication. And that is uh, very much uh, uh, the tone uh, set and which informs the collections that reached uh, Europe through the mediation, in particular of um, Bühler. And you can see there are lots of interactions with, with scholars who spent ages in India, like Tessitori, Charlotte Krause, a student of Hertel. These are important mediators, European scholars living in India, many of them working for the Indian um, uh, government. But they interacted only with a selected group of um, Jain scholars. And uh, this is important here it's in the letter of Indra Vijaya, where he makes it clear that they're actually a total minority of the Jains who interacted with Western scholars. Most of the Jains were very conservative. They wouldn't open uh, the doors of their traditional libraries, the Bandaras, to foreigners, not even to, to Jains themselves. They were controlled by sets of trustees, certain monks, and so on. But they're very, very rich. They have the, apparently the richest collection of Jain of manuscripts in the entire world. I think there are more manuscripts uh, stored there than in all of China. Um, so uh, conservative monks opposed these reformist uh, monks. And uh, he says, you know, there are only 500 scholarly monks in all of India at the time, no more than 50 are capable of working in the literary line. Some of them are orthodox. Some of them wouldn't work with, with Western ignorant people. So that leaves only a handful, really, who are prepared to do that. And nothing has changed. Um, that is a, also a point I would like to make. Even now, very few uh, people uh, uh, interacting are interested in this kind of academic work but some are very much so, and these are the interlocutors. And the contacts with those interlocutors in India are actually inherited, they're handed down from one person to the next in, uh, in Europe or wherever, in, in Japan, where this line of research is pursued. And what do the Jains get out of it? They were mainly interested in methodology. They were interested in spreading their teachings all over the globe. And now with the internet, this is of course taken off greatly. And they were blamed initially for it. But here you see the real principle of Jainism are pushed forth and spread. I'm sure that Jainism uh, will hold its own place. So they were very confident. And it was a time of revival. And it, is, uh, it has to be said that actually the fact that Jacobi translated these texts and the interest in Western scholar um, helped the Jains to define themselves as, an, as a Jain a separate group and therefore push for uh, political privileges. And the construction of Jainism as it is nowadays is in other words uh, uh, partly 
due to the interaction with, with scholars uh, such as uh, Alsdorf, some of which occasionally visited India and went through honoring pro processes and all of this. Um, of course, there was a lot of uh, internal uh, talk about uh, natives and uh, um, that they do not work uh, methodologically correct and they're lazy and all this, but the respect for the monks was also is very high. And uh, I know time is short. The Bühler letters are very, very important. Um, and uh, here is the chronology of the Berlin acquisition of Jain manuscripts. Important here is to note that Bühler first inquired with Albrecht Weber, uh, who was, of course, uh, the spider in the web of Jaina scholarship. Um, how uh, is he interested in these texts? Of course he was, because it was an entirely new field of research. And then uh, they together somehow arranged for the library uh, through the uh, ministry, which had to uh, agree uh, to, uh, to spend uh, money on this. And then there were uh, different manuscripts um, and so on. So there's a very interesting story here. And uh, um, also the national competition with England and so on. The, and France, they, they all wanted to have the best uh, collection that played a role here. Um, okay, so I'm coming to the end. I just wanted to uh, show one more thing. I always have too many uh, slides, don't worry about that. Oh, here, there was the question in the previous um, talk, and generally, where do the manuscripts originally come from? In some of these letters, it's quite clear. Here, one installment is from Ratnavijaya Suri's library, um, and uh, uh, Kevaldas was, uh, of course, the person where most of these manuscripts were bought, but Bühler paid an, made an, an extra effort. It, due to his uh, um, impetus, the collection of Sanskrit manuscripts for the government of India, British colonial, uh, was uh, started. And he acquired duplicates for European libraries. And to get them out inquired, uh, required a lot of political negotiation, filling out the right uh, documents. And he, of course, motivated Kevaldas and people like him uh, to uh, get these manuscripts out of the traditional libraries. And there were obviously some uh, yatis, uh, sort of fallen monks, who were interested in selling these texts. And uh, here you can. Uh, well, I have more evidence. You want to want me to stop? Thank you very much. <laughs>